Um, well, it's a real pleasure to be here with uh, old friends like Marlon and Olga and uh, up there <laughs> and uh, have a chance to speak to you about uh, my research, which is now about the, the beginning of this is now 10 years old. You, it's sort of blocking things, but I guess I'm not going to worry about it too much. Um, uh, but now I think I have a better perspective on what I did 10 years ago. So it's going to be fun. This is a new colloquium uh, for me. So um, <clears throat> some of the slides may have little bugs in them. Apologize in advance. So I'd like to recognize my collaborators in this work, Yi Dong Chong, Li Ge, who were both in my group at the time, Wei Sao, my Longtime collaborator at Yale, and then Ali, and my new collaboration with Philippe Galvin at Ren, which you'll see some results from that. So, time reversing labor, what laser, what it means, and what it's good for. That's sort of what I need to explain. So, we're all familiar with a, a laser. You put it a medium in a cavity, and you uh, hope that something nice happens. And so now we're going to talk about uh, the time reverse of that. You send something into a cavity, you know, something different, nice happens. Um, is this a lower picture possible? Under what conditions? What does it mean physically? What new phenomena does it encounter? So first, I want to say that everything I'm doing pretty much is going to be uh, classical electromagnetism. Uh, so a lot of weird quantum here. Uh, which is the specialty of this. Um, so, as I said, so you start a laser by having an optical resonator, uh, and there's a light field in there, and there's uh, an output mirror here, and a better mirror here. Uh, this resonator will have uh, resonances with a certain level with kappa, and Q is omega tau related to kappa in the following way. This is what you'll measure to find the resonances for the transmission spectrum or the reflection spectrum. Um, then you need a gain medium, which is some kind of atomic molecular medium that you can pump energy into somehow. Uh, and as you pump harder, the um, uh, some, somehow self-organizes to emit coherent light. Okay, so this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, below threshold, you have the red curve, which is spontaneous emission near the transition frequency of the gain medium, very broad, and then you get this narrow peak out on the output power. Graph. Uh, sorry, that's what I just said, lazy lines above. Okay, self-organized system. The pump is just energy, it's not specific. Um, and it finds the lasing frequency in the electric field mode that it wants to emit. Uh, <clears throat> why does this system emit this coherent narrow band radiation instead of just more amplified spontaneous emission as you keep pumping more energy? Okay. Well, it goes back to this guy that you, for those of you who don't know, that's the young Einstein before the hair got out of control. And um, uh, in 1917, he enunciated the principles of the quantum theory of radiation. So you imagine a bunch of identical atoms and you focus on the two levels that are gonna be responsible for laser emission, although he wasn't working on lasing, it was more general. Uh, generally, uh, at room temperature, the atom is gonna be in the ground state mainly. The electrons are going to be in the ground state. And uh, that's gonna be our gain medium eventually, okay? And uh, now if a photon comes in, then it can be absorbed by the medium, excite the atom to the uh, uh, side level. Uh, and then, uh, and that process is called absorption. Uh, and then it can just spontaneously drop down emitting a photon and that's called spontaneous emission. And that's actually the new thing. That's the quantum effect, okay? The other thing that I'm gonna talk about, which is if I do have electron in the excited state, uh, and I send in coherent light, 
it will stimulate that electron to emit a photon of exactly the same type um, uh, uh, as the incident radiation. Now, Einstein, uh, this stimulated emission is just like driving an antenna. So it's actually a classical effect, but since the laser is thought of as quantum, I think there's often some confusion about the fact that stimulated emission is a classical effect. But spontaneous emission is an uncaused event in physics. For, for no reason, that electron just decided to decay and uh, emit a photon. So that's where uh, Einstein uh, looked at it and he said to his friend, Max Born, the weakness of the theory lies in the fact that it leaves the time and direction of the elementary processes to chance. Nevertheless, I have full confidence in the reliability of the course taken. So, um, so he wasn't really happy with this, and there's a lot about that in the book. Um, now, Einstein didn't come up with the laser, uh, but I give the most credit to this guy, Charles Town, it's roughly 25 years later, uh, when um, uh, he started to work on the, the microwave version of the maser. And in, in, in the laser or maser, you invert the medium, that is, you start by pumping energy in with more electrons in the higher energy state than in the lower energy state. And then you send coherent light through and you get lots of stimulated emission. Maybe you get a little absorption, but because you've inverted the medium, the stimulated emission wins and uh, you get amplified light out. Okay, so stimulated emission beats absorption, you have amplification. And so it's very tempting and they do call that light amplified by stimulated emission of radiation, okay? But that actually isn't what we usually are thinking of nowadays when we talk about this. Oh, I did want to mention that when you have an inverted medium, then uh, you get an index of refraction, which has a so-called imaginary part, n prime here. And if it's inverted, this will have uh, the sign that leads to the growth of the wave as it travels. So you should think of this inverted medium as having this complex index of refraction, which has a negative sign, the imaginary part of this. So that sounds uh, like a laser, but it's not a laser yet, okay? Because it's not a source of radiation. It's just an amplifier. And though actually the word amplifier is in the title, most things we refer to as lasers are not um, uh, our sources, okay? So to get a laser, as I said, you need something more. And what you need is to put it in an, uh, an optical resonator. And then when it does spontaneously emit light, that light will bounce back and forth, creating more st now stimulated emission. And then eventually some of it will leak out, okay? And if, this, if you get more out on each round trip, then you lose from the escape through the resonator, you get a steady state source of coherent light. So to be a laser, this outcoupling loss, outcoupling through the mirror and other losses has to be less than or equal to the, the gain that you get when you bounce back and forth and cause more stimulated energy. So you could write this condition in this way is the reflection coefficient of the mirror times this gain factor that I just mentioned, that should be greater than or equal to one. Um, and then you'll get self-organized oscillation and just build up uh, on its own. So that we would call a light oscillator by stimulated emission of radiation. So I see a few people smiling. Gee, I wonder why they picked laser instead of Loser, <laughs> so uh, so that's um, uh, yeah. They chose to just stick with laser. Okay, okay. So it sounds like this was a pretty easy thing that Mr. Towns did. Uh, he uh, Towns believed he could produce coherent microwaves uh, from the maser. He used this uh, ammonia ammonia molecule that could do this kind of popping motion, and that has certain vibrational energy that he would use to be uh, the, the transition frequency. Um, 
But as he'd spent a year or so working on this, his two older and more famous colleagues, Ayai Rabi and Polycarp Kush, both of whom won the Nobel Prize, by the way, said, look, you should stop doing this work. It's not going to work. You know it's not going to work. We know it's not going to work. You're wasting money. You should stop now. So Town said, I simply told them that I thought I had a reasonable chance and I would continue. I was then indeed thankful that I had him. So, um, so even these brilliant things, you have to fight through some skeptics. Uh, so he did win uh, for the Mazur principle, Town won the Nobel Prize himself. The fundamental work in the field of quantum electronics led to the construction of oscillators and amplifiers based on the Mazur. Okay, so back to our laser loser. What selects the frequency? The number of uh, uh, beams you get out of the laser, the frequencies you get out, the electric field pattern is emitted by the laser. Well, how about a really weird laser? A really weird laser was discovered or invented by my colleague, Wei Sao. It's just a bunch of little nanoparticles of zinc oxide, okay, which you uh, pump so that there's gain, there's inversion. So any light that gets emitted does bounce around, but there's no like edge, it just flies out of you. So people didn't really think something like this would emit sharp later laser radiation, but it does. And here's some data. This is below the threshold and then these narrow lines are when it's starting to emit laser radiation. So what we wanted is a general definition of lasing or laser and a theory to answer the detailed questions, at least in principle. Okay. So uh, let's look at Maxwell's equations for a laser below threshold. But let's do it now for an arbitrary weird laser. So we're not going to make a nice pair of mirrors. We're just going to say there's some cavity, which I'm denoting by epsilon cavity of R. This describes the scattering from mirrors or from particles or whatever from surfaces. And then there's a gain medium of atoms that we need to pump. And uh, then we write the equation, the Maxwell part of the equation. You're going to look for a solution which is just oscillating at frequency omega and has some space dependence. Okay. And um, uh, this is the simplest kind of Maxwell equation you can write down with uh, the Helmholtz essentially form. There are more complicated ones, and everything I say would be correct for the more complicated ones. I'm just using a relatively Simplified. Okay, and this gain uh, susceptibility, which describes what, what comes out of this thing, has a real part, chi one, and an imaginary part with a negative sign. So we know that's going to give amplification. So, um, and this is proportional to the pump. So you're pumping energy in, and this gets bigger and bigger. This amplification gets bigger and bigger. Now, the, the boundary condition that you're looking for to solve this equation is that there's no waves coming from infinity, purely outgoing, sometimes called Sommerfeld radiation. So that's, that's what we want. That's not the boundary conditions for when we send in a wave and it bounces off and gets amplified. For a laser, it really comes out of the medium. Okay, there. Um, so with this, these boundary conditions, you usually won't be able to solve this equation. The eigenvalues or the frequencies at which there will be a solution are discrete. So I'm gonna call them omega sub nu, and they can be thought of as the eigenvalues of this differential equation. I assume most people in this audience know about eigenvalues. Okay, so, uh, so let's, uh, let's think a little more about that, okay. Uh, being a kind of eigenvalue problem. So first, um, if we look for outgoing only solutions, we're not using all the solutions of the wave equation because they're the incoming solutions. Those are perfectly good solutions too. And we're only guaranteed to be able to make a solution if we use all of the possible uh, free solutions to make a solution. So uh, because of that, we're going to have to be lucky to find solutions. But this is the problem 
oops, I don't know why that's in the timing. Okay, of resonance. On resonance, we look for a solution that's purely outgoing at infinity, and it turns out we can find many of them, but they're discrete, they're not continuous. Okay, they are not physical solutions because each of these electric fields will go to infinity at, at spatial infinity. Um, but the frequencies, the real part of the frequencies that we find will tell us at what frequencies the waves constructively interfere, constructively interfere inside this object. Now, um, if there's no amplification or, or attenuation here, then, we, well, with no amplification, then we can't get any uh, light out of nothing. Uh, so, uh, uh, so if we're gonna find a solution, it cannot be at a real frequency. Whoops, where I'm out of solution. Okay. So we're gonna find a complex solution and uh, in the lower half plane of frequency, um, but it, with this negative imaginary part of the gain, which we will now allow to appear, we can move it up. And when it becomes this solution uh, reaches the real axis, that's the general definition of when the system will self-organize. So there it is, self-organizing and lazing. As I said, this is the general definition. It's a random laser, a weird laser, like this D-shaped chaotic laser we still can find the first lazing mode of this thing by adding this gain and watching the resonance move till one of them reaches uh, a real frequency and it doesn't have to be. Okay. So, <clears throat> so just solving this equation, we can predict what the lazing frequency will be and what the threshold amount of power or gain we need to put in to make it work. So, uh, so to show you uh, another example of this, here I have uh, I have a random set of particles that don't have any absorption or gain; they just scatter light. In the middle of it, I put this gain particle, and then I pump on this, and here's this amazing random lazing mode that will come out of it which I can calculate by this method. And that's how we did calculate it. Um, so some things like this will self-organize and, and laze. And if you look out here, you see this is a very complicated wave. This is a whole superposition of many simple waves. It looks quite complex and it's adapted to the actual shape of this aggregate. Thing, there is a solution that will go through all those scattering particles, and all of the light will actually find its way through and be absorbed, which we find by solving the laser. What's my initial value for which? <laughs> so, what we do uh, is, you know, we can, as I said, we can calculate the resonances, and then we can just follow the resonances as we increase the gain here, and we find the frequency at which it crosses the real axis. But also you have to solve the eigenvector, so that gives you the superposition. You start with some superposition, the eigen, that set of equations is a linear system and you get the eigenvector out uh, by setting the determinant to this well, pattern out as well as the frequency. Tell you more, but it's pretty straight. Okay, so can we get something else out of this? Well, and the answer is yes, that's the topic of my talk. What about looking at incoming boundary waves instead of purely outgoing boundaries? Okay, so if we impose those instead, okay, uh, that's just going to be the complex conjugate of my previous boundary condition. Okay. So if I complex conjugate the Maxwell equation, so I have E star instead of E, and I com complex conjugate the gain susceptibility and the frequency, then if I had a solution, I get a solution, a new solution, that's the complex conjugate energy, which is, uh, sorry, field, which is purely income. And if there was no gain and loss in the system, again, this is on some timer. 
okay, then um, this thing would occur at the complex conjugate frequency of the outgoing solution. But then just as I did with gain, now I can add absorption, okay? And if I put in exactly the same amount of absorption as I had to add gain to the same cavity, then this is the solution that I will have. This will be at real frequency, so it'll be a steady state solution with solving incoming boundary conditions. So we have perfect absorption for the time reversal of the lasing mode. We call that coherent perfect absorption. All right. Now, um, now a very simple version of this has been known for 75 or 100 years called critical, critical coupling. A simple example of that is shown here. I have a perfect mirror, some kind of dielectric cavity uh, with a partially reflecting mirror at the front. And I add absorption to it. And then uh, I send in a normal wave. There's a reflected wave from the back and the front. And if I find the right frequency and the right amount of absorption, I can get that to cancel. And that's called critical coupling into this resonator, in which case, uh, in, in the experiment that I'm thinking of, the, the, the energy really was absorbed as heat. In the Another example that's actually used in silicon photonics, where I have a ring coupled to a, a waveguide, and uh, where they use this critical coupling there, where they input a wave and they want to turn it on and off. And so when the coupling here is equal to the round trip loss of this wave when it comes in here, then you can show that nothing goes forward. Okay. You trap the wave and typically it's lost by radiation. Yeah. So those two things are not exactly the same. This asymmetric fabry perot I didn't call it that, but that's what it is, is coherent perfect absorption with only one input channel. So you have no need for an adaptive wavefront. The energy is absorbed. Here it's really just radiated into another channel. However, though this was known for 75 or 100 years, I don't know how many years, no connection was ever made to laser, as far as I know. So the critically coupled uh, ring is not CPA, it's impedance matching without absorption, and then it's re radiated So I'm gonna talk about the difference between those two uh, later in the talk, but this one is really a simple example of what I call time reverse glazing, but it's so simple people didn't notice it. Um, so this leads me to my claim that there's an unappreciated symmetry of Maxwell's equations, which I've already mentioned, which is that if you solve the linear Maxwell equation when it's just about to start to laze, okay, at the frequency where it will laze, omega L, okay, so you solve that problem, find the threshold lasing mode and frequency and how much you need to pump to get it to laze, then you've also found another solution in which it's purely incoming, uh, it's perfectly absorbed in the cavity, and uh, cavity has the same material loss at the same frequency. So you're guaranteed that this thing can be done uh, because of time reversing the equation of the laser at pressure. So we wrote this paper now 12 years ago, uh, pointing out this symmetry that's exact no matter how, many, how complicated the system is. Uh, and I should mention a few things. It's not the time reversal of a pulse. A lot of people have thought about sending out a pulse and time reversing it and then catching it coming back. This is a steady state sink. I'm steadily sending this radiation in in the right wavefront, the right frequency, and it's all going into the system. So it's a steady state sink. This is being calculated with linear optics. So if we can't get rid of that energy, we would get, it would go off resonance, but let's assume we could then sink it well enough that it will stay very highly absorbing. Uh, and we're not enhancing the material absorption. We're just creating a trap, a one-way trap door to the light. It's stuck in there. There's no place for it to go, but eventually be absorbed. Um, and time reversal is only applied to the wave equation, not to matter. We're not, you know, in, in the real laser, you have a lot of heat generated before the laser light comes out. 
but you know, we're not time reversing the dynamics of matter, only the wave. And finally, we have perfect impedance matching, but only for an adaptive waveform and only for transduction. In other words, we get this by absorption from high gain, okay? Loss is not contained, you know, scattering loss would be obtained if the thing scattered, but it doesn't scatter. So this is transduction of energy irreversibly that we're talking about here, but later we're gonna generalize. Okay, is that all pretty clear? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, critical coupling. Okay, here's the simplest example that you might want to look at, which is non-trivial. So we already, already looked at the one-sided fabry perot So now two-sided, two mirrors with a weak absorber in between. People many, many years ago thought, well, if I get this thing on resonance, then I'll build up a big field and then the weak absorber will strongly absorb. Okay. You come with one beam and sure enough, it strongly absorbs, but it maxes out at 50%. You know? And the reason why is that this is not the time reverse of the lasing mode. If, you, if this were gain, it would send out symmetric beams. So I'm only hitting it with half of the lasing mode and I only get 50%. <clears throat> okay, so here's the trap. Yeah, that's the balance. Otherwise, right, right. So in that one, it's one channel. There's no way to access it from the other side. Yeah, absolutely right. So you literally look at it and say, if I put gain there and I just pumped it up, what would it do? And in this case, it would emit symmetrically because it can, in the previous case, You'd say, well, it can't go through a perfect mirror. And if it's unsymmetric, it's still, you'd have to then time reverse with unbound. So all of that works. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So to make a perfect interference trap, we need to send in two beams with the right relative phase. And then because of the symmetry of the problem, it'll either be zero or minus phase or pi phase. Uh, and then we'll get 100% absorption. So let's try it. Okay, so we did this experiment in the way Sao's lab. We used a silicon wafer, which was not designed to be a coherent perfect absorber, just was like our, what we had in mind, a low Q Fabry Perot etalon. Um, and we had a, we illuminated coherently uh, with a phase control so we can roll the phase and find the right phase. We also have to find the frequency, which this is the point. There were multiple frequencies. Okay, and then the theory just says that, you know, there's going to be some frequency at which it's zero. And then if we go in with the other phase, which in this case happens to be the even illumination and the CPA has an odd, you know, uh, teams that are minus each other. Uh, so we'll get a dip here, but when we roll the phase, we go all the way up here. And if we, you know, we'll get something, we'll get less absorbed than but there will be a phase in which nothing. Vary the phase, we'll see this kind of thing. So this is data, okay? And then we've already found the right frequency, so I didn't go through that part. And then as we move away from that frequency, we don't come all the way down anymore. Um, and then we should find this place where it's independent of the phase, but the experiment wasn't mounted enough to find that. Still, the trend. So we did this simple interference experiment of uh, time reverse lasing, and it worked adequately, and we got you know ninety nine percent absorption there. <clears throat> and this experiment came out in in uh, Science, okay. And so we had to have a press release, and so the Yale uh, Public Relations Office said, well, "No one will like." No one likes coherent perfect absorber. <laughs> so we need to call it something else. So I said, okay, call it the anti -wave. Well, that was, I don't know if it's great, but it works. <laughs> okay, so this is Google, uh, 1,600,000 uh, hits on anti-laser uh, a few months later. 
Um, you see, uh, we have uh, have uh, Popular Science, UPI, Wikipedia, PC World, New York Times, etc. Okay, but we're in Texas, so uh, to really impress you, Fox News. All right, scientists and they here's how they covered it. Okay, dear James Bond, the next time a laser beam threatens to cut you in two. Switch it into. So anyway, uh, so he got a lot of publicity because of the anti-laser. Terminology. Well, here's why it didn't work quite the way I wanted it. Um, so remember this, um, this uh, laser, the random laser, you know, now we should be able to turn that around and have a, a buried CPA absorber, like I showed you. Uh, so people did an experiment uh, to try to test that. They put in a lot of scattering Teflon things here. I don't even know what they are. They had eight external antennas, one central antenna. Um, I tried to find the wave fronts and frequencies of which Central it's very much like this experiment. Sure enough, uh, they, they did it. Uh, the blue is coming from outside, and the uh, it turns out this, this experiment isn't exactly CPA because they're really sending from one antenna to another antenna, which they can then time reverse. That's not irreversible absorption, it wouldn't be in high gain wouldn't be part of the, the susceptibility of the matter, I wouldn't think, so because you can time it. But still, it's a cool experiment. And, and it works. You know, and it comes. That's the time. And it is sensitive to the relative phase. They take any of these antennas here, and they move them off the right phase, and you don't get reflection distance. Um, so here's something that CPA might be good for. So now I'm going to introduce, um, so this is my collaborator, Philippe Delune, and uh, he's got this microwave cavity with this eighth of a sphere which scatters light randomly, chaotically throughout the cavity. The top has been taken off so you can look in. There's one input port when the top's on, and then there's this this pixelated surface here, which is a 16 pixel liquid crystal scrambler. And when you change one of these pixels, it provides enough uh, disturbance to the waves in the cavity that it sort of scrambles the resonances. Okay, so he can look through different resonances, different settings of this to find different CPAs. And he can do optimization on this thing. So it's easy for him to find a setting where he gets 60 dB, okay. you see there's a 20 dB uh, background here. Um, so that is lossy, but, uh, but still this is four orders of magnitude in the background. And now he finds a different frequencies, um, different settings of the metasurface, this is the same, that will give you CPA. But if we don't look for that, we just get the background. So he knows the special setting that will cause no reflection. And he said, well, somebody said in this paper, let's use this for receiver powered secure wireless communication. So, <clears throat> so the idea is that Bob is sending in all these frequencies. Okay? Bob is the one that's providing the power and wants to get the information. Alice here controls the medicine. When she wants to send a one in a certain frequency, she turns it to a, a, a CPA setting at that frequency, and then Bob gets no reflection, he gets a reflection dip, aha, that's a one, and back to zero, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, uh, and it's secure because Eve, if Eve doesn't perturb the box, then uh, this port will not show, you know, there's a very weak perturbation, 
It just, there's nothing special about this report. It won't have your reflection when this one does. <clears throat> and if, if Eve does perturb the box too much, then the CPA will stop working and we'll know there's an eavesdrop. Now, of course, it was pointed out that if this is not quantum secure. If this port is tainted or you know, not secure, then you'll get the signal. But uh, at least the eavesdropper here doesn't. So that uh, was also Chicago CPA on it to understand information. Um, all right. It's also useful for analog differentiation, but I Okay, so let's go back now. Okay, well, maybe I'll stop for a second. So I've told you what CPA is. I've suggested something it might be good for that's been demonstrated. Any questions at this point? The general principle for finding input wave fronts that if you can tune the frequency and the absorption, it will be perfectly absorbed. You know they exist by this demonstration. Now I'm going to generalize beyond that. So remember this case, which you had no reflection here, but it wasn't CPA, you just radiated, which is similar to the experiment. Um, it's really just rooted to another channel. It isn't actually um, CPA in terms of absorption. Uh, but this is often what we want to do. What we often want to do is root signals, not uh, route, root route signals, not, um, not uh, absorb them or transduce them. Okay, so is this possible in general? What, what, what is the, 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 the formulation that includes this? So let's start with zero reflection. Right? We want no reflection, but we also want to do root. So, now I'm gonna introduce the thing that I haven't introduced yet uh, called the scattering matrix. I hope many of you have some vague well, knowledge of this, but anyway, I've got some object and I can access it through a certain number of channels, which I've just been schematic here. And it could be guided waves, it could be waveguides and fibers, but it can also be free space, okay? And I'm then going to define a matrix that takes me from the inputs in each of the channels, alpha two, three here, up to N to the outputs. So the uh, first column tells me what happens if I put something only in alpha one, and the second one tells me what happens if I put something only in alpha two, and so on. And then all of them together tell me what happens for any superposition of inputs. And you can calculate this from the wave equation and from the knowledge of this object. So if I put nothing in, then this scattering matrix better be infinite or I can't get anything out. So that's the case with resonance. And they, they talk about a pole of the scattering matrix because at the frequency where I have a resonance, these, these elements will actually go to infinity. Uh, if calculated them correctly. Uh, but now if we think about CPA, it's the opposite. We put something in every channel, we get nothing out. So in this language, that's what these two things look like. Blazing or resonance, there's nothing in, something out. The CPA is something in, nothing. Okay. So, um, so now the generalization is, well, let's put something in three of the channels, say, or N of, N of the channels, nothing in the rest of the channels, and then let's get no reflection back into the channel. So that's impedance match, everything gets routed forward, right? So that means that we have a submatrix of our scattering matrix that's got to have an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. The determinant of this submatrix has to be zero at certain frequencies, right? And those are the frequencies at which we get no reflection. So now let's formulate this. Well, it looks very similar to CPA. Okay, it's some matrix who's uh, got to have a zero eigenvector. So we're gonna call this a generalized reflection matrix. And when it's determined as zero, we'll find a frequency at which we can do this. Just like for resonance and for uh, the, the zeros of the whole S matrix, this will happen at discrete complex two. 
same mathematical structure, but different spectra. So there are just different complex frequencies where you'll have no reflection. And then of course we can think about tuning to get that to be a real frequency where it's an actual impedance match solution. Okay. Uh, you don't have to add loss or gain here. You could just change the geometry, which is sort of what Philippe already did. There's a, uh, and this is a completely general theory because the special case where the submatrix is the whole matrix, we're back to CP, we're back to current. Okay, so we know how to solve this problem numerically for some complex geometry. So here's some weird shaped waveguide junction with six single mode waveguides coming in. And we look for a solution with three in and three out and no reflection. And that spectrum is this kind of uh, magenta, is that magenta? Okay, purple. Is that spectrum. And then different boundary conditions here, all these little dots are other boundary conditions, but all in and all out are here. So these are the resonances all out. These are the incoming states of the zeros all in. And these other, other boundary conditions are different spectrum. They're not the same thing, okay? So, uh, so you have to calculate this new spectrum. It depends on whatever problem you want to solve or zero reflection. We call them R zeros instead of zeros because they're for a specific subset of the inputs. And uh, without any symmetry or tuning, you're not, they're not going to be a, a real thing. You do have to tune. So we tune, we tune one of these leads a little bit to get this guy here and stop. So we call that an RSM for a steady state inflectionless scattering mode. And we did this for an open junction with low Q. So the transmission here is multiple resonance. It's not to one strong. So here's the Here's the um, uh, sort of animation of that uh, inflectionless state is coming through here. You can see it is actually coming in out there. You also see that it's kind of rotating and that's because it's going through multiple resonances. If it went through one resonance, it would just be blinking on and off. I can show you a picture of that, but I didn't include it. So it's a very non-trivial thing because you have to guess how to get it to go through three resonances. Now we'd like to be able to do this in situ. So at this point, this is three years old. I said, well, we put something here that allows us to, you know, uh, uh, change the scattering properties and tuning it until we get the thing we want. Okay. Because I vaguely knew about this technique, which you know, we're using of this medicine. So you can tune to a particular reflection of scattering mode. You can toggle between them. You can optimize for functions beyond reflection. So this is a very nice, simple computational way. I promise you, you can find these RSMs easily computationally. Okay. But it doesn't constrain where the output goes. And very rarely is that useful, unless there's only one output. If there's multiple outputs, you usually want to control it. That's what routing means. Okay, so we have to go beyond it. We build on it. So we're gonna do a kind of constrained optimization where we wanna keep it reflectionless and then we wanna route it to say a single point. Right? With omega one to go there, and omega two to go there. And of course, people have been trying to do this and do this, but the more complicated the junction is, the harder it is to do. Okay. Um, and certainly very useful right, if, if it could be done. So, um, okay, so now uh, this was posted on the archive a week ago. We've been working on it for a year and a half, but uh, like this is a similar, but not exactly the same microwave system. It's got two of these metasurfaces and it has like two to the 300 <laughs> configurations. So there's such a huge parameter space that you can just keep tuning and optimizing for a huge parameter space and look for things uh, if you want, okay? And so in this case, we've got four ports, not, not one. And uh, 
we still have this strong absorption in the walls of the cavity, which is not desirable. So this is like a demonstration of principle, but obviously you don't want to lose 99% of your waves by absorption uh, when you're routing. So our belief and in, in simulations, we can do it without loss of work. But here we want to do it. Okay. So then let's say we wanted to do these two guys in and these two guys out. Then we would measure the S matrix, create this sub matrix and a lot of frequencies, and then uh, and then keep doing it for different um, different settings and find the optimal one. So when we do that, so here's just some something to indicate we did a random and then iterative search to, to find one of these optimal settings. That, uh, for example, has RSM, and we found a lot of them. We found thousands to hundreds of these RSMs, okay, here. And this is showing you know, the numbers we found, and there's much more detail here that I want to go into, because it depends a little bit which ports we choose and so on. But basically, we found lots and lots of ports. The RSMs are pretty, pretty deep. Yes. Um, so, and this is the RSM that they found when they just optimized to find reflection. But then they optimized to find reflection lists at this specific frequency, and they found it at 5.2. So you can put it at 5.2, and it turned out to be deep. Um, now, one thing you may have noticed here, uh, I just, this is too complicated maybe to understand all the details, but basically what happens is you, it's easiest to find all in CPA solutions. Less easy to find three in and one out, and then it's a little less easy to find two and two, and then one one in and you know, three out is even less. So why is that? Why did they find it? It actually kind of confirms the picture. So let's say we had no loss. Okay, so we had no loss, and CPA solutions there would be a band of them in the upper half plane. They have to be in the upper half plane. And they would be the most in the upper. And then when you put one in and three out, that's still closer to all in. So it's in the upper half. Two in and two out should be kind of balanced. It should be a band around uh, being right either upper or lower half. Three in and resonance would be below. This is what it would look like with no loss, but there's a whole lot of it. So we add the loss, all this stuff gets moved down. Okay. And now we see that the CPA is the one that's closest to the real axis. So it's easiest to use your tuning to get there than to go you know, from here to there. Okay. So that actually makes sense what they found. Okay, it's highly overdamped. You might have worried that it's so overdamped that no matter what we do, that metasurface, we can't get anything to come back this far. But it turns out, yes, we need fluctuations. And this, obviously, as I said, it favors CPA, but we also better hope that this is kind of broader than I've drawn it because the tails go up. That's in fact what we find when we do the numeric to see where these, these uh, eigenvalues lie in the complex mega plane. I won't go through this in detail, but you can see this is no loss obvious. It's about three or four times more. Our point. So the first thing we wanted to do is demultiply. So we have, oops, sorry. we have um, two frequencies coming in through this. Uh, one, we want the uh, green one to go to three and the blue one to go to three. That's a demultiplier. Okay. So you can optimize this in software. We have all the S matrices. You can just play with it, not actually do the simultaneous multiplication. And we can find out what we should do. We find we can do quite well. Okay, so this is, uh, we've chosen two frequencies, 5.1 and 5.2 gigahertz. And there's, uh, this is the reflection. So there's 50 dB of suppressed reflection. Um, and then, that indeed um, uh, those support. Blue goes into 
this is for two one, and there's uh, no transition for three for the red signal. Uh, sorry, for the for two for the red signal. This is very little uh, in this red, and as much as we get in the background, the blue. And then it's the opposite way around for for three. It gets the uh, red signal, it gets the blue signal, and then because we want to actually do this. We actually did look it up simultaneously, put in the frequencies. There's some complicated calibration that I won't explain here, but we end up in situ with uh, 40 decibels of discrimination. So we have a decent uh, discriminator from the uh, multiplex. This multiplex means many signals are coming in here, and then we want to distribute them. Okay. Now, the nice thing is we can reprogram this in situ. We can just, uh, so we can go from one choice to another. Like here, this is maybe the original one, 5.1 and 5.2 gigahertz. Then we can go to different frequencies, 5.1 and 5.3, different settings of the metasurface. That's what we call it. And then to change, let's see, this is just uh, even bigger frequency spacing. And then this is higher frequency. Oh, you're interesting. So you can just reprogram this and get this to work. And here was all the data that shows it's working. You can cut out. So I'm just showing you what you can do. You can move the frequency in the space and you can change the connectivity. You can have this one going from here to here and that one going from there to there. So the connectivity, all these things you can do. Patterns. Uh, so it looks, uh, and then Finally, uh, you can actually send two of the same frequency, coherently combine them and have them go out that channel. So that's actually a multiplex. It takes disparate signal, puts it on the same. So um, it looks like this kind of setup, even though it's not a practical setup, the technology is a universal reconfigurable pattern. Just using linear optics and some of these principles, if you need a, obviously a good control unit. Like this. Okay, so I just have one more fun thing. I'm almost done. Um, so, uh, so you remember the time reversible laser, and there's something else that uh, Alexi alluded to that people have been interested. In. Suppose I have a cavity with half gain and half loss symmetrically balanced. That's called parity time symmetry because if I do time reversal, I'm going to interchange gain and loss. And this parity symmetric through the parity, then I'll just come back to the same uh, cavity under time. And this has some interesting optical properties. I'm just going to mention one of them. Okay. Uh, so let's look at the symmetry, symmetry properties of resonances under this PT operator. So, so PT symmetry means that the uh, dielectric function as a function of X is, is uh, this complex conjugate at minus X. So minus X is the parity operation, complex conjugation is the time reversal operation. So that's parity times time. And if these two things are equal, that's what I just showed. Okay, but that's mathematically. Okay. Um, so I'm going to denote this balanced gain and loss. So green will be gain, blue will be loss. And I've got some, this is just a schematic of, this is a resonance of a parity symmetric cavity of frequency omega. It's purely out. Okay, let's act with T. So we go to omega star. And we also interchange gain and loss. So the blue's over here, the green is here. Now let's ask with parity. So <clears throat> we get back where we started, but we have omega star and the arrows. Okay. So this suggests that um, um, if I have a resonance of this cavity at omega, then I'm going to have a coherent perfect absorption in the complex plane or a zero of this cavity. Uh, at omega star. That's what this simple uh, thing indicates. 
So the, re the resonances are mapped to zero to the megastar under previous But now we have broken time symmetry, meaning we have loss and gain in the system. So that means that unlike the case where it's lossless, yes, then the zeros and the, and the resonances were complex conjugates, but they could never be real. You could never get to the real axis because that violates conservation of photons, right? But now, because we have time reversal break, we have gain and loss, there's nothing that prevents them from getting to the relax. But this tells you that they have to get there at exactly the same frequency because when omega is real, or is omega. Right? So if you can get this thing to lays, it's going to also perfectly. So that's, that seems a little odd. How does that work? Okay. So first, let me show you. Let's start with the passive cavity. So this cavity has got, it's just a dielectric with partial mirrors here and here, and no loss of gain. So that's gonna have equally, it's gonna be here. These are the resonances or the poles. These are the zeros here um, before I turn on the loss of gain. So now I'm gonna turn on the loss of gain. I'm gonna crank it up and, you know, if I only put on gain, things would move up. If I only put on loss, things would move down. What are they going to do here? Well, I've kind of hinted at what they do. So the anti-cross, some of them go away and some of them go up. Some go down, some go up, both the poles and the zero. But when they reach the real axis, it's exactly the same frequency. So I have a zero and a pole. The S matrix is infinite and zero <laughs> right there. But it's actually two different modes of the S matrix. One of them has zero eigenvalues, the other has infinite eigenvalues, or it's about to win. Okay, so that can actually happen. It's nothing not contradictory, sometimes called CPA laser. How can I do both at once? Remember, a laser threshold doesn't have any output. It's about to output, but it doesn't have any output. This is a laser threshold. So, yes, people went and looked for this. I'm sure there are other good, good experiments. This is the one I know about. Okay, and uh, they made a more complicated structure, very cool looking with, uh, they put these strips here, they're pumping it. And so where there aren't strips, where there's gain, okay, and there are strips, it's shielded from the pumping and it's lost, okay. And then they find there are two modes, one of which lives mostly in the, Well, no, they didn't. But one of them is the gain mode and the other is the um, And then when they excite it correctly with the right phase, they get amplification, which is the red. And when they excite the same structure, but with an opposite phase, they get. Um, depending on how you excite this. Um, Thing, it either amplifies a lot or it uh, unfortunately. So that's more or less what we were looking for. But you want to check that this is actually about to lay. So then they, they, they just pump harder and they find that it does lay. Um, uh, so there can be something that's simultaneously a laser and a perfect absorber if it has. So to summarize, there was this, I would say, unrecognized symmetry of macrophysic lasers. So there are new kinds of modes of the electromagnetic field with useful and interesting properties. They're either perfectly absorbing or reflectionless. Current perfect absorption is uh, possible as the time reverse of lasing. You can figure out how you need to excite it if you know how the laser emits. The more general thing I just introduced was this linear theory of impedance matching, which includes CPA, but also includes other reflectionless modes. If you have a reconfigurable cavity, you can achieve universal signal routing. And it's really cool that if you have PT symmetry, using a perfect absorption, essentially the same frequency. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Yes.
Yeah, we, I mean, with nonlinear systems, you can visualize it. So we, we do have, uh, you know, the nonlinear CPA, uh, you know, you're taking into account the saturation of these books. So the way you want to do this is um, you, uh, oh, you're gonna pump up the thing from, uh, from, um, So what you want to do is as you pump harder, you want to keep this on the real act. Either there'll be one of two things. Either you can get perfect absorption at a point. So if this is real omega, um, if I overdamp the system like this, then I, I pump hard, I start to saturate the absorption. This will float up and at one value, it'll perfectly absorb and then it'll pump. Or you can, um, or you can, um, uh, you can pump the system uh, such a way as to keep it, right? So uh, you over damp it, Right? And then you uh, pump it uh, with some a second pump. It moves this here, and then as you put more light into the thing, so you're saturating. Then you turn this pump down to keep this, here. and then you have something that has an output that sort of looks actually interesting circuits and so on. So yeah, we have a whole theory of this that my students will see. Uh, and I think, okay, I mean, there's more complicated things. You can have by stability, et cetera, once it's nonlinear. We've also looked at that for CPA, but not yet for our son. I mean, if I start thinking about super radiance, then my Maxwell equation reasoning is out, right? So I have to actually say my gain medium the atoms are coherent right? and coherent, you know, that they're talking to each other. And well, my understanding is that, you know, I, I've got many, I got one photon shared among many atoms. And I'm assuming I'm in a solid medium. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, I think I have to use a completely different framework. My understand. I don't understand super radians as well as you do. I'm sure of that. But I, I think right, this is the gain medium is sort of there's no coherence. I mean, I, if I think about the, the laser, right, each atom is independent, you know, or, you know, organized. So super radians. I mean, all these coherence things, which I'm sure. How many things have you done about? <laughs> yeah. I haven't thought of it, but people that know more about that should try to take these ideas. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> uh, so, I mean, there's just no analog of, uh, you know, don't, in the way we inject electrons into dense matter is we just put a voltage on and we let them, you know, come from the reservoir, right? So we can't control the phase of our input. We can't control the phase, even two electrons from the same reservoir. So, I mean, obviously in free space, this has been this way. You can do this in quantum mechanics for sure. Okay. Yeah, there's too much. 
too much, too much going on. We need to be able to control the quantum waves well uh, in order to make a certain wave. But I will tell you, we, I'm working with a, a chemist on um, you know, trying to bring in uh, reactants in coherent atomic beams so that it's the analog of this. That if you bring in both reactants coherently, you get no reflection, which means that the reaction goes forward. So I think that's kind of the most exciting thing that I can think of yet for, for quantum, not for dense matter, because dense matter is so uncontrollable. Thank <laughs> you.